All right, good, good morning to you. My name is Coach Michael Burke. I, uh, do these guys know anything about me prior to coming? Not, I don't think none of them have ever heard you. Okay, so. great. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the morning together. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but uh, I have done a lot of work, a lot of coaching with the city of Franklin over the last several years. We've done a lot with the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. And uh, so we're going, to be spend, we're going to be spending the morning with each other. And uh, we're going to be spending the morning with each other, so we need to get to know each other just a little bit, right? My, uh, the reason I'm called Coach Michael Burt, you see this big gaudy ring on my right finger, is I actually spent a decade of my life as an actual women's basketball coach at a place called Riverdale High School. Are y'all familiar with Riverdale? Okay, so I, so I got to Riverdale in 1996. I was 19 years old. Okay, and at 19 years old, I, they hired me to be an assistant at Riverdale, and that was the first year you could coach without teaching. You could have one assistant on your team that didn't teach. So I was in college going to MTSU, and I was coaching a little elementary school in Woodbury, Tennessee, which is where I grew up, and I was the head coach at Woodbury Grammar School at 18. And so at 19, I get a phone call from the head coach at Riverdale, and he's like, I've heard about you. I've heard you're this young little whippersnapper that can flat out coach. Will you come down to Riverdale and be one of my assistant coaches? Now, at Woodbury, I was making $199.50 for the year. Okay, so I hear people complain about how much money they make a lot, and I'm like, would you work a hundred? Would you work a whole year for $199.50? Because that's what I did, right? I built the office, drove the kids to and from the games, coached the team, and that was my job. I mean, that was my job, right? I didn't have another job beside that job. And uh, <clears throat> so at 19, I, I won a championship at Woodbury Grammar, which is the only championship they've ever won in the history of the school. And I win this little championship that got a big banner that says state champions. And, and I get a call at 19 from the head coach at Riverdale. Okay, Now, I'm a small town boy, grew up in Woodbury. And here's what he says to me. Hey, I've heard about you. Heard you this young coach that can flat out coach. Will you come down to Riverdale and be one of my assistant coaches? And I asked what any good 19-year-old would ask, which is what? I'm like, well, how much are you going to pay me to come to Riverdale? I'm already making $199.50. I was like, you may not even be able to afford me, okay? I actually said these words out of my mouth. And he laughed and he said, we'll pay you $2,000. And, and I was like, $2,000? Man, I will be there tonight, right? <laughs> so I 10 times my income in one, right? So now I'm, now I'm going to college at MTSU and I want to be a teacher and I want to coach kids. And this is all I've ever wanted to be since I was 15 years old, okay? And, I'm, and so I go to college at 7, 8, 9, 10. And I leave at 10, 11 o'clock every day and I go straight to Riverdale. And I, I made a couple rules. I would never leave until the head coach left. How many of you believe behind every great number one is a great number two? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so this has become a lost art in our society, by the way, serving another person in their vision. We live in such a selfish society today that everybody wants to know what's in it for them. There's a lost art of serving another person and, and somebody else's vision why you're in the number two spot, right? Because everybody wants to be number one. And so I said, look, I'm going to be a great number two. So I coach, you know, I, I get his bags. I, yeah, whatever he needs me to do, I do it. And 18, 19, and 20, and then, and then he decides to retire, and then I become the head coach at Riverdale. Now, Riverdale was a football school. If you know anything about football, anything about Riverdale, we had won four state championships in football. we have been in nine state championship games. I mean... For a period of time, Riverdale dominated high school football in the state of Tennessee, public schools. Okay, and that was because that was because of a guy named Gary Rankin, who was who we hired away from the Smith County at one time, and then he became very dominant at Riverdale. And so I get there and I go, "We're going to win a championship in girls basketball," and everybody laughs and they're like, "Man, this is this is a football school. You forget it." it. Took me ten years to build this thing. So ten years, I worked eighty hours a week. Now this is what's going to tie into what I'm teaching you today. For 10 years, I worked 80 hours a week every week. I worked eight hours a day on Sunday. I would get up and go to church on Sunday morning, and I would go straight to my office, and I would typically stay from 12 until 8 on Sunday. Many days I would get to the office at 6.30 in the morning and go home at midnight. Okay, now during that period I wasn't married. I'm married now, I have a daughter, didn't have a family, didn't see any of my friends. Didn't see him in my family, but I did accomplish what I was hired to accomplish, which was to build a championship culture. Okay, now you say, what has happened now? Riverdale has now won six of the last eight state championships in girls basketball. 
They have been the number one team in the country twice. And what, what I started in those 10 years has now become one of the greatest high school basketball programs in the United States. Okay, so now mamas and daddies are dying to have their kids play at Riverdale, right? Because now they're signing with UT, Connecticut, you, you know what I mean? George, they're signing with some of the biggest schools in the country. But when I got there, basketball was awful. I mean, it literally was awful. I mean, they would have years, decades of losing, you know, four years of losing, one year of winning. It, it was just bad, right? But, but it showed me the power of commitment and what could happen. You say, well, why are you doing what you do today? So, so around, what, what, one of the things I did that was very different than other coaches is I was building the whole person. Now, 18 years old, I read a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about the whole person. We're going to talk about this today. And what he said was, a person is made up of four parts. A body, a mind, a heart, and a spirit. S-P-I-R-I-T. Each of these parts produce four different needs. Body's need is to live. Mind's need is to learn. Heart's need is to love. Spirit's need is to leave a legacy, to matter, to contribute. If you're a faith-based person like I am, it's a connection to God. Everybody with me? Now, when I read that, I read that at 18 years old. And I said, when I become a leader and I start coaching, I'm going to find a way to tap in to all four parts of my player's nature. Okay? I'm going to show you how to do that today. Because when you understand this mon mindset, so I said, how am I going to do that? Well, I said, well, I'm going to teach all of my players those seven habits of highly effective people. I'm going to teach them the principles of good to great. I'm going to teach them the five dysfunctions of teams. So I was teaching. Imagine you, if you had a daughter. Any of y'all got daughters? Imagine your daughter, if she played sports, playing for me. And she's coming, and I'm teaching her all this stuff at 14 years old, right? And man, it's just like blowing people's minds, what I'm teaching these kids. So you know what began to happen? We began to win, and win, and win, and win. So much so, when you start operating at a very high level with something, what, what do people typically want to know? What are you doing? So the biology teacher would come down and say, what are you doing with these kids, man? They love playing for you. They are producing. And I said, well, I'm coaching the whole kid. And I would show them this model, and they didn't understand what I was talking about. I said, man, I'm teaching them all this stuff. So then so many people began to ask me about it. I said, look, I ain't got time to explain what I'm doing. Why don't I just write a book about it? Okay? And so I wrote a little book at 25 years old called Changing Lives Through Coaching because I believe a good coach can change your life. And it was really... Uh, it was really my way of saying, this is what I'm doing. If you want to know what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. Read the book, right? Because I ain't got time trying to win a championship. I ain't got time to explain it. Well, a funny thing happened. So we're winning at a very high level. We're producing. We're getting max. Because mamas and daddies would drop their daughters off to me and say this. Coach, my daughter's got a lot of what? Issues. Yeah, issues was one thing they said. <laughs> but really what they said, and I have a five-year-old daughter. And Lord, she is just like me. The good Lord has blessed me with a daughter with a strong will. I ask my wife all the time, where does she get that strong will from? My wife's like, are you kidding me? You know where she gets it from. And she is so strong-willed, and, 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 and she's not defiant, but she is what will hold her ground and push, and she is relentless, man. And I love it. I love the fact that she's relentless because there's no classes in how to teach a kid how to be relentless, right or wrong. I'm not talking about how to go get something. I'm talking about no, overcome objection, overcome excuses, overcome obstacles. And I love that my daughter has that in her. Well, mamas and dads would drop their daughters off to me and say my daughter's got a lot of potential. She just needs something. What do you think they said she needed? Guidance. Guidance. Discipline. Discipline. Motivation. Structure. Accountability. Focus. Here's a big one. Confidence. And I'd say, thank goodness you brought your daughter to us because we have our own little greatness factory. <laughs> and we manufacture greatness at my place. And I'm going to take your daughter, and when I'm done with her four years from today, there is nothing she won't be able to do. I mean, I, so we would put them in this system that I created. 
man, we would just churn those kids out. And we would churn them out confident. So, so what happened was, but I would always ask those parents a question. I said, now this is going to hurt just a little bit because i got to ask you a question. You're telling me that your daughter's got more potential. Have you ever sat down and talked to your daughter about what potential really is? Or have you just talked at her? Right? There's a big difference between me telling my employees, Eric White, you have a lot of potential, and me sitting down and explaining to him, this is how you activate this potential. Talking at him is you got a lot of potential. Figure it out. Read a book. Show up earlier. Sit down and go, let me look at what you're doing and how I can help you do it better. You see what I'm saying? So I would ask those mamas and daddies, have you ever explained what potential is to your child versus just told them they have more potential, number one. And I'm going to ask you the hard question, are they watching you reach your own potential as their parent? And that's the one that got them. Because is it not hypocritical for us to tell our children that they have potential and they can do more when they are not watching their mom and daddy reach their own potential? Yes or no, right? So the greatest gift, you know, someone asked me the other day, if I could give my daughter one gift that God gave me, would it be my intelligence? No, because I'm not that smart. What I would give my daughter is a relentless pursuit, a spirit of relentlessness, that she can go get something even when she meets obstacles and resilience and problems. That's what I would give my daughter. You with me? But I want my daughter to see me reaching my own potential. That's the best thing she can see every day is daddy gets up, and, and he hustles, he works, he pushes, he strives, he dreams. You see what I'm saying? I want to instill that in her. Well, I can tell her all day long, but her watching me do it every day, right, is another thing. So <clears throat> what we became really good at, and what, if you're managing people, managing people is one of the toughest jobs in the world. What I want you to start thinking of yourself as, as a master of human potential. You cannot manage another person that has their own body, mind, heart, and spirit unless they choose to be managed. Now, how does a person choose to be managed? What do they do? <clears throat> okay, so, so, so a person, so a person that shows up and says, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. See, they're choosing not to think. A person that comes in and gives bare minimum effort as, so they don't get fired is choosing not to care. Everybody with me? A person that shows up to work and says, I don't really even care about anybody here or this deal or, or how good we are. I'm just going to show up in the body. And I'm going to trade my time and my energy for money. I'm basically renting the city of Franklin my time and energy for money. Everybody see the difference? Because I'm not here in the spirit because I don't believe in it. That's confidence, by the way. This is confidence over here. See what I'm saying? This is skill right here. This is knowledge right here. This is passion right here. So what, what, how good, how valuable would I be to you today? How valuable would I be to you today if I just showed up in the body? And I said, look, I'm going to be here. We're going to be here for a couple hours together. I'm going to give you as little effort as I can give you. And I'm going to try to make it through this, right? And you're going to trade some money for my time and energy. But I'm not, I don't care about my performance. And I'm not really here in the mind. I'm checked out. I'm thinking about something else. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here in the spirit. I'm here physically. Is it possible for a person to show up at work and be there physically but not be there with their most important parts? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't care about my work. I don't care about my job. I don't care about my performance. I don't care about anything. I don't care about my coworkers. I'm just here physically. You understand what I'm saying? So until you understand this, how to tap into all four parts of a person's nature, what you end up getting is the body. So we become masters at, at this right here. And this was way ahead of the curve because I was doing this in the early 2000s. Then I was writing books on it. Well, when I wrote the books on it, we brought some of them over there. When I started writing the books on it, here's what people said. Hey, will you come speak to my team? These companies started to call me. They said, hey, will you come talk to my people? And here, here's what's so funny. They said, 
We, our people have a lot of what? Issues. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they did say that. But they also said, look, we got a lot of good guys, a lot of good women. They all got a lot of potential. They're all good people. They just need something. What do you think they said they needed? What? I didn't hear that one. Did you get that one on camera, Jack? <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Uh, so what did you say? They need a good kick in the ass. So let's call that motivation, okay? <laughs> and there is a theory out there called the great jackass theory of motivation. And the great jackass theory of motivation is carrot and stick. It is a motivational form. And the motivational form is when you do good, I give you the carrot. There's reward. When you do bad, I give you the stick. That's actually a theory of motivation, right? Well, here's the, bad, here's the challenge that I found. And listen, I made every mistake you can make in leadership. You're not going to be able to throw one at me today that I hadn't already screwed up myself. Make sense? When I first took over, I, when I first took over, I motivated through fear. And here's the problem with motivating through fear. It is a short-term fix to a long-term problem. And it only works when the external stimulus is there. So let's say I'm managing you two, and when I'm here, man, I, I'm, I'm, I, I motivate you through fear. You do what I tell you to, I fire you. Do what I tell you to, I fire you. Do what I tell you to, I keep you doing. I'll suspend you, whatever. That works when I'm standing right here with you. But when I leave and that stimulus is gone, now you just go back to doing what you were doing before. You see why it don't work? So companies were telling me, my people need, they, they didn't say a good kick in the ass, some of them did, but what they did say is they need motiv motivation. Right or wrong? Do you have employees that need motivation, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so to motivate another person, you gotta understand, you really need to understand the psychology of motivating a person. So a person is only motivated when they have something they want. They are motivated away from pain, and toward pleasure. You understand what I'm saying? A person is motivated by what they'll lose many times more than what they'll gain. Okay? So, so, so I started studying every model out there. Like, how do I motivate you? How do I motivate an unmotivated person? How do I get a person that's not on board, on board? So I started studying this at very high levels and I began to write books about it. And then companies began to hire me and say, will you come over and speak to our people? And I'd go speak to their people and they'd say, hey, our people really enjoyed this. Will you come back? And I said, no, I'm busy. I'm, bu I'm, I'm busy trying to win a championship. This is not what I want to do. I don't want to coach adults. I love coaching kids. That's what I would say. And they'd be like, no, 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 come back, come back. And then I was speaking at Dell Computers, which is a huge company. This is 15 years ago. Dell was one of the biggest companies in the world at that time. And I spoke at Dell Computers and I said, they said, will you come back? And I said, no, I'm not interested. Thanks for buying my books. I appreciate it. I got to go back to my team. And the guy from Dell opened up his thing and he, and he pulled out a check and he said, well, here's your check for coaching our people today. And I opened up that check and it was more in an hour than I made in a whole month. And you know what I said then? I said, man, I'll be back every 15 minutes. You need me to be back tonight? I'll be back tonight on the night shift, man. But, but there was a carrot and it was a big carrot. And I was like, okay, now maybe we can think about this, right? And, but, but I didn't, but listen, I, that was not my life's dream. My life's dream was to win a championship at Riverdale, go to college and be a major division one coach and be the next male version of Pat Summit or be the next big coach in women's basketball. That was my dream. And so, but the more I spoke, the more people asked me. Then, I, then they started offering me saying, will you, come, will you be the coach of our team? And will you come in and coach our team every month? And I was like, no, and then I was like, so finally I won a championship at 31. By this time I had four or five books out in the market. I was getting requests to speak all over the world. And so at 31 years old, after I won a championship, I retired from athletic coaching. The last nine years, all I've been doing is coaching people like you all over the world. I've, I've had big government contracts where I've coached government workers. I spent four years in the prison system of Tennessee rehabilitating offenders because 98% of people that go to prison will get out and most of them turn around and go back to prison. Now, you know who pays for that? We do. You do. I do. So I spent four years in a, in a government contract in the state of Tennessee teaching correctional officers how to, how, to, how to coach offenders so that they could get out of prison and stay out of prison. Because what we looked at is every model in the world is not working. 
The correction officer spends up to eight hours a day, just like you do with your employees sometimes. They spend eight hours a day with the offender. And so I said, they're not going to change unless they have a coach. So let me teach them how to be a coach. Now we got, they got a coach all day. And if we can get them out of prison and keep them out of prison, it saves everybody a lot of money, hopefully changes their life, all that kind of thing. So they use my book called This Ain't No Practice Life for the prisoners, this one. So every prisoner, you know, hundreds and hundreds of prisoners in Tennessee were, using, were reading this book. And I would go into prison sales and maximum security. Now, you've never, you've never, you think you got a bad day some days when you're out there collecting trash. Let me take you inside a maximum security prison where they tell you when to wake up, when to eat, what to do. They don't call you by name, they call you by number. Inmate number 1747, get up right now, go eat breakfast. Now you can use the bathroom. I mean, it, is, it will freak you out. It's a place you never want to end up. You understand what I'm saying? Never. There is nothing worth, nothing worth you ever doing something to end up in there. And I would go into these prisons and train. And, uh, you know, walking through the yard and them saying, hey, pretty boy, love that bald head. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, get me out of here, right, as fast as you can. Because I ain't nobody's pretty boy in this prison. <laughs> but I would go, I would go, I would go inside the jail cell. I would go inside their little cell and they would have all these quotes up there for my books. Never let your past hold your future hostage. And they would say, Coach, I'm reading your book. It's changing my life. Here's my plan when I get out of prison. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was very rewarding work. It was tough, but it was rewarding. And so over the last eight, nine years, all I've been doing is coaching people, okay? And, and when you coach as many people as I do, I was in Houston, Texas yesterday. Houston is a booming market. Boom. When I say booming, I mean Houston is a rich, rich city of just action. Okay, and when I get away from, we live in Tennessee and things move slow in Tennessee. And I get out and travel all over the world and I come back and I'm like, man, we're moving slow. <laughs> we're moving real slow, which is good. I like, I mean, some of it I like. I'm like, man, this is good to go at this pace. But they move fast in other cities. Things are happening and there's opportunity everywhere, right? And if you ever think there's not enough opportunity, there's 7 billion people on planet Earth. 7 billion people, there's no shortage of anything. There's no shortage of opportunities, there's no shortage of money, there's no shortage of anything. The only shortage is the way you think about it, right? It, it, it ain't a shortage, trust me. It's out there. It's just a matter of whether you go take advantage of it or not, okay? It's out there for everybody. And so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to unpack a few concepts. And uh, one of the concepts we're going to talk about is a concept called crumbs. Now. The, the, I'm going to combo two concepts to, to, together with you, okay? So, so I'm going to just ask a question as we get started because I want this to be interactive. If you said there's one thing you struggle with the most, one, one big frustration you have right now in your work, here's what you can't say. You can't say the whole, uh, all millennials are lazy. You know, if you're hiring 20 to 30 year olds, I hear this a lot, all millennials suck, they're lazy, they don't have a work ethic. And here's what I'll tell you, there's 80 million millennials. Surely to God we can find four or five of them that can do something. Yes or no? <laughs> so that's a generalization. I just had an intern that was 21 years old. And I'm going to tell you what, if I could hire her today, she showed up every day. She was dressed up. She had an unbelievable attitude. She worked hard. She could take criticism. She's 21 years old. She's a millennial. So what I would tell you, they, are, they don't all suck. A lot of them are lazy, entitled, don't know have a work ethic, but not all of them. You understand what I'm saying? There are some that, that will get the job done. You just got to find them. Everybody with me? Now, I understand you guys have turnover, and the quality of the workers that you're having is getting lower and lower. So there's two parts of this equation. There's two parts of this equation, though. I believe, I believe to attract better people, we must become more attractive. So I want you to think, if you want to get better talent, it has to be attractive to want to come work with you. Everybody follow me here. To attract, to attract more people, we must become more attractive. Okay? And that has to do not with what you pay necessarily, although that is a variable. It also has to do with, hey, is this somewhere I want to come work every day? Is these the kind of people I want to be around every day? Or do, do, do they complain and gripe and moan and whine and pout and bitch and make excuses? Or are these people that I want to get up and go do something big with? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so part of attracting better talent is becoming a great place to work where other people want to come work with you. 
I mean, we routinely have three, four, five people a week that want to come work with me. And they're like, man, you're going somewhere. I want to be on board this bus. I want to be part of what you're doing. Okay? So we attract highly motivated, smart, aggressive, progressive people. Does that make sense? I don't attract deadbeats. <laughs> they're like, man, I don't want a part of Captain Positive. You know what I mean? So that's exactly the way I want it. I want to attract a certain type of worker to me. Everybody follow me? But to do that, you got to create something that people want to be part of. Now, here's an interesting thing. I couldn't recruit at Riverdale. Eric's a former director of uh, operations for... So how many, tell, tell me how many places you've been the director of ops for. Uh, five or six. Yeah. So he was the director of operations at Ole Miss. He's been the director of operations at where else? Middle Tennessee State. Middle Tennessee State. Yeah. Any, Again, number of colleges, uh, East Tennessee State. Yeah. Austin P. So he's been the director of operations for a lot of very difficult people to work with. High ID type A's, right? Drivers. People that accept no excuses. Well, in my mind, that really, that really prepared him his whole life to come work with me. He's tough. He's motivated. You see what I'm saying? He wants to get better every day. Those jobs have prepared him to work with me. Okay? Because when you're, when you're working in the SEC, you got to produce. It ain't playing around. You ain't there to mess around, right? So my point, though, is, is when you're out there trying to figure out how to make something, he's got to have opportunity. He's got to have opportunity to, to, to grow and get better as a person, and he's got to be attracted to what we're doing. You see what I'm saying? We can't just say, hey, you know, come over here and work with the Franklin Sanitation Department, and, uh, you know, we're going to beat you down every day, and it's going to be, a, you know, you're going to really love this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if you don't like it, you better shape up. What's going to happen is you're just going to continue to get low-level people, and that ain't never going to change. So, so we have to own this responsibility some part, right? We can say we need to get tougher people, but we also need to say, how do we make this a better place to work that good people actually want to come work at? Okay? How do we make it where good people want to, want to work at? Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to cover the, the, the mindset you need to attack a day right now. So let's talk about some of the big, greatest frustrations that you have that you're facing right now because I want to make sure I'm on point uh, during our time together today. Okay? Start over here. Anything's on the table. Any frustration you think you say, hey, the biggest frustration I fight or biggest challenge I fight right now is this. And tell me what you do every day, too, so I'm, so I'm clear on that. Supervisor in the, the commercial section. Okay. Which is the, we have our pretty, it's a small section, but, um, you know, I, not a lot yet. I started in April, so I'm still kind of. My way to still new, still on the honeymoon stage, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Everything's great. I don't know if it's still honeymoon, but it's <laughs> <laughs> and we attracted him all the way from California. Yeah. Good, good, nice. Um, the honeymoon stage. I, I've got, a, I've got, I've got a person I'm coaching right. I've got a person I'm coaching right now, and this is they just got married, and he came home from his honeymoon, and and, and the day they got back from his honeymoon, his wife left him. Oh, wow. First day after the honeymoon. And, uh, what is it? Well, okay, and, and so he's going through a rough time, and of course he's paying for me to coach him because I coach about 250 people. Those 250 people are paying about 5000 a year for me to coach them. And they go through a big program I have. And so I, I see all the struggles they face, not just their business, but their personal. And so we're having a conversation, I'm counseling him, and, and, and what do you say to that? I said, would you rather know now, would you rather know five years from now? When you got two kids, after you built the new house, would you rather know today? Because what she's telling you, she can't handle adversity. If that's all, if that's the biggest adversity you're gonna fight, f face, is the day after the honeymoon, one one little argument, there's gonna be a whole lot more adversity than this. Would you rather know today? Would you rather know five years from today? Right? That's the only thing I can say to him, because that's that's my thought. That's what else do you say? But I think what people what, what happens is when you start fresh in a job. It's new. The brain loves new, novel, different. Your brain is, is a cognitive miser. It, it is both the greatest thing you got and the worst thing you got. Because your brain will actually tell you all the bad things that are happening too. So when someone starts new, it's new, it's exciting, it's a new opportunity, it's fresh. But then over a period of time, it, it becomes normal. And when it becomes normal, the brain likes to get lazy. And what it does is it likes to like, you know, hey, I, then you start to see the negatives. 
then, then, you, then you start to feel disenchanted, right? Then it's like, well, there's all these problems. That's with every job, no matter what job you're in. So, so supervisor, I want to bring this up because how many people in here have their title is supervisor? Okay. Anybody give me a good definition of supervision? Anybody got a good definition of supervision? Okay, that's good. That's good. Because I want, I want to actually shift your mindset a little bit today to, to, to get you thinking differently than just a supervisor. One of my definitions of a supervisor is, is to make sure nobody hurts themselves or hurts each other. <laughs> right? I, may, I show up and I make sure nobody hurts themselves or hurts each other, which is a, an important role. But, but the number one thing that employees tell me they want from their supervisor or manager is what? What do you think they tell me they want? You say respect, respect, understanding. understanding. Here's what a lot of people say. They want more time with them, which is odd. Because you think, well, they want more time with me? You have something they don't have. That's why you're a supervisor. That's why you've been promoted. They don't have the skill sets you have. So I want you to start thinking like this. You have, let's go back to that whole person. We'll unpack some more today. You've got knowledge they don't have. You've got skill they don't have. You've got desire they don't have. You've got confidence they don't have. Everybody see that? If they had it, they'd be in your job but they want it. The way they say they want it is I'd like to spend some more time with you because man, you got something. Every person, even some of the, I've seen some of the laziest people in the world, they do want to make progress. They do want some type of opportunity. They do want to learn something. But, but how do I get, so think about this. How do I get, how do I get this from you? See, for Eric to prosper, what, what the best thing I can give him, remember what I told you I'd give my daughter? If I could give my daughter one thing, what would I give her? My relentless spirit, right? My pursuit of something, and I don't stop, man, like a pit bull. And I think I got this from a single mom that had me when she was 16 years old. I watched that woman scratch and claw for everything we ever had. You with me? Somehow she gave it to me. I don't know how, because my, my dad does not have this. My dad's biggest goal in life is to drink beer and have fun. I mean, I'm like, am I, are you sure I'm your kid? Because I am the exact opposite of my father. My father's goal in life is to just, he just retired. He was a factory worker for 30 years, just retired from being a supervisor. Man, he, he wants to go gambling on the weekends. He wants to go fishing every day. We, it's like we don't even have the same gene. You understand what I'm saying? But my mama, my mama gets up every morning at 4.30. She's at the working. You see what I'm saying? She's a driver. Well, I'm not saying that's wrong for dad or wrong for mom. I'm not saying one's right one's wrong. But, but most of my success has come because of a relentless pursuit that I have inside of me. Well, Eric, for Eric to prosper in his life, he's got to grow his knowledge, his skill, his desire, and his confidence. Well, how can he do that? How can I take what's in me and give it to him if he only spends five minutes a week with me? Most managers spend less than 15 minutes a week with their employees. Everybody with me? Now, I'm going to spend three hours with you today. For three hours, I'm going to take 25 years of coaching, and I'm going to give you as much as I can what's in my brain. Right? Right? But, but I'm going to spend more time with you than you may spend with your workers in a month. So what they say is, look, I'd like to spend more time with you. They don't say it that way. What they really want when they say I'd like to more time is, is they really want this. you got a certain knowledge set and a skill set and a desire. you got something that I want. But I can't get it from you because I don't ever get to spend any time with you. Some of your workers need more motivation. But the, the, what's going to spark their motivation is watching you work, seeing how you attack a day, giving them your, your, your spirit, giving your, your, does that make sense? 
So when I think of supervision, the only problem with my definition of supervision is, let's go back to the prison system. And the prison system, and you say, what's it, what's it got to do with the prison system? Hey, someday, any day, y'all feel like you're running a jail? Here's how it feels. is Let's say I'm the worker, and you're my supervisor, and what I really want to do is progress, but, but there's no transfer from you to me of your knowledge, skill, desire, and confidence. So remember, what we did in the prison system is we took this person and we made them better. And we said, I want you to get better, and then you're going to turn around and give this person what you got. Because of this, then we're going to change this person's life right here. Well, supervision is, you're going to make sure I don't mess anything up. So I, want, I actually want to shift your mindset from just being a supervisor to, see there's a, I go from supervisor to being a manager, from a manager to a coach. So over here I make sure nobody hurts themselves, hurts each other, everybody does everything on time. Over here I'm managing process, system, structure. Over here I'm actually making people better. I'm coaching people. Now I know what you're going to say, I got some people that are not what? How do you know until you try to coach them? Maybe they don't see you as a coach. Well, they are just more or harder to coach. And that's, that's the way life is. Some are hungrier than others. So when you tell me a person needs more motivation, typically a person becomes motivated when there's something they want. What, is, what, what do they want? So think of it this way. Why buy, what you could, why buy with money what you could buy with emotional satisfaction? Some people want to be recognized. Some people want affirmation. Some people want a place at the table. Some people want to be inside the inside group. Right? You find out what a person wants. It ain't always money that you got to use to get it. I've actually paid people more money and their production went down. I'm like, well, you told me you wanted more money and I gave you more money and you're actually performing worse. So it wasn't the money that you really wanted. What did you really want? Well, I want to be recognized. I want to be... I want to be inside the circle. I want to be at the top of the table. I want this. Okay, that's what you really wanted. Why buy with, why buy with money what you could buy with emotional satisfaction? You understand what I'm saying? So, so you said your biggest challenge right now is what? Uh, guys that want, to, they want to take care of their own thing. <coughs> and uh, they, don't have, they don't have the, the overall... That's right. Operation in mind, they just, you know, they do their thing, they could get back in, and yeah. you have to ask them or prod them into do Sometimes they do it on their own, sometimes they don't. That's right. Okay. Now, let's just call it what it is. Sel that's selfish. That's a behavior selfishness. Now, we use a, we use a, we use a, a, a methodology here when I was a coach called the whole part whole method. That means I would show them the whole thing. Then I'd break it down to parts. Then I'd show them the whole thing again. The reason I did this is because I need them to understand your part is a big part of this whole thing. But let me show you the whole thing so you really understand it. Because if not, all you're focused on is this. If you ever study systems thinking, think about the number of things that have to work. Think about the number of things that have to work for your car to get you here this morning. Take one spark plug out of your car and see if you get here. That's just one little B part. Take one wheel off and see if you can get here. Take the steering wheel out and see if you can get here. Take the accelerator out and see if you can get here. Right or wrong? See, you don't think about that. That's a whole system of things working together. You take one part out and it's a big part. So a lot of times I show people the whole thing. Let me show you why this is important. Like I see your little part, you're focused on this right here. But you don't understand the unintended consequence of every time you do this, it affects this person, and it affects this person, and it affects this person. Okay, and in a lot of ways, that's selfish for you not to think like that. You need to think about the whole. Then let me show you what your part is as part of this. Whole part, whole method. Because by nature, if you understand human psychology, we are all selfish by nature, right or wrong. We're living in the greatest self-interest nation in the world right now. It is not a team environment. That's why it's so hard to build teams. Okay, so that's your challenge. All right, what's your challenge? It's pretty much the same as David's, only the negativity. Okay. A lot of negativity. Do you allow it? Well, somewhat. You try not to. 
Okay. When you say you try not to, what do you mean? Well, there again, I'm, I'm kind of new myself too. Yeah. So in the supervisor job. That's good. So I want you to remember something today. We encourage what we allow. We allow people to be negative, they'll be negative. We allow people to be late, they'll be late. We allow people to run each other down, they'll run each other down. So here's what I say. We don't major in the minors. We don't have time to compare, complain, contend, criticize, be complacent. So here's what I find out. And, and this, is, this is the thing about, Dave Ramsey has a rule, and I'm, I'm not all on board with Ramsey. Some things I agree with him, some things I don't. But he does have a rule I do agree with. First time he catches an employee gossiping about another employee at his workplace, first time's a warning, second time he fires you. And he tells you that when they interview you. The first time we hear you talk negatively about another employee at this place, you get warned. The second time we hear you talking negatively, we fire you on the spot. Do you understand? He just says there's no tolerance whatsoever. For, it's bad enough we've got to go out there and beat people in the world, let alone beat up on each other, right? So what I did is when I was a coach, I made a couple rules. Number one, be 15 minutes early to everything. Now, here's what I said, because I, I found out what they wanted. Here's the deal. If you, if you were late to the meeting, I wouldn't let you in the meeting. And if you missed the meeting, guess what you didn't get to do? You didn't get to practice. And if you couldn't practice, how could I play you? That went for my assistant coaches, everybody. And the reason I did that, so I had one player in nine years be, one player in a decade be late. These are 14, 18 year olds. Because I said, don't ever be late. They said, well, my mom and dad's got to drive me. Get your mom and daddy up. You want me to run them? Because I'll run them if you want me to run them. With you. But don't be late. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I, would, set expect, I would set very high expectations and hold people accountable. Here's somebody being negative. Look, we ain't got time to be negative. It's bad enough we got to go out there and win. I ain't got time for this. So, so I just, I, what I do is I let people know up front, listen, I ain't playing around here. If you want to work with me, there's no time for bitching, moaning, complaining, pointing fingers, making excuses. Okay? This is the way I run this shop. Okay? If you want your own shop, go start your own shop and you can do all that on your time. But not on my time. Okay? It's too many things to do in a day. So what I try to do is set very aggressive expectation and then I hold people accountable to that expectation. If I say, here's your goal and you don't hit that goal, I want to know, I want to know why you didn't hit that goal. You told me you could do it. I'm trying to help you do it. Why are you not doing it? Right? So, so what I try to do is just raise the expectation of people. Okay? All right, what about you? What's yours? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, my biggest challenge is going to be changing the culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of how things were managed in the past. Yep. Method of yep. So give me some adjectives to describe the culture. Um, Say it. It's okay. It's a safe environment. <laughs> <laughs> right, E? It's a safe environment. This is safe. You're with the good doctor today. This is a safe environment. <laughs> Listen, you don't think, I've seen every culture you can imagine, okay? Okay. Okay. Low motivation. Yep. Fear. Fear. Okay. Drama. Specialists. Drama. Okay. Drama. Yep. Drama is just low wasted negative energy. Okay. A lot of drama. Okay. Lazy. Okay. Now. Let me ask you this question. Can these cultures be turned around, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, right or wrong? Yeah. So, so here's what I always ask people. What am I doing to contribute to this culture? What am I doing to contribute to this adversity we're facing? What, what will I tolerate and not tolerate? What expectation will I have? Because you can turn a culture around. It happens every day. This is why when you study sports, they bring in one coach. Look at Harbaugh at Michigan. Look at Saban in Alabama. These are places that were very mediocre places before these people got there, right or wrong? 
I almost said look at Butch Jones of Tennessee, but I don't know if I can say that or not yet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Here's my point. These people are turnaround specialists, right? They come in and they take this right here, and within a few years, they're operating here, and then they're operating like that. You know what they do? They walk in and say there's new expectation here. There's new accountability here. There's new, right? And they always almost go out and get better players too. So Butch Jones, the first thing he did at Tennessee is he increased his recruiting budget. Tennessee was the second highest recruiting budget last year, 3.5 million, something like that, 3.7, because he walked in and said, I can't win with these players. These players that duly recruited, I cannot win with in SEC. We've got to get rid of them, and we've got to bring in better people. You understand that, right? Now, once he goes and gets those better players, now the pressure's on him. Now you've got to win with these players, because you told us, Give us more money, we'll get better people. We got better people, and you're not still not winning. So, so, so now, it's, now the pressure's on him, right? But is is the workplace not the same way? If you knew how many people I had gone through to get to the team I have today, how many people I've cycled through, the turnover that I've had of low skill level people that I just kept going through and going through, till I said, look, I am not accepting anything but grade A people, better people. I'm hiring better people. Okay? I mean, I went through at least four different staffs where I fired everybody. I mean, all of them. Because I kept going, you can't play at this level. You're not ready to play at this level. And I just kept going until I kept getting better people. Now, when I get better people, it's no different than sports. When you get better people, what happens? They come with, better, they come with batteries included, number one. Now you can really get in there and coach them to much higher levels because they show up with batteries included. They show up ready to go. They're not low ordinance thinkers. See, low ordinance thinkers show up with a bunch of problems every day that they brought from home. High ordinance thinkers fight through that and show up and, and they check their problems at the gate. And they're like, I'm here to work. Let's go. And here's what I noticed. A players want to be around other A players, don't they? People that really want to get it done show up and want to be around other people that get it done. They ain't got time for anything less than that. So, so this is the culture you currently have, okay? And, and then in an ideal culture, what would you have? Selfless, high motivation, no fear, okay, no drama, okay? The, the culture you want has got to be transition. So it starts with expectation. But, but would it not be true that every culture is driven by the leaders, yes or no? I'm looking at the coaches in the room right now. I'm looking, right? I'm looking at who the coaches are. You're the coaches, okay? All right, so you got a big job ahead of you. But you know what? I love turnaround jobs. <laughs> Don't you? I love taking something that's underperforming and getting it to perform. And I love when people say it can't be done. I love when people say, come on. Ain't way you're going to do that. I love being able to go back to those people. You know, I would have teachers tell me about kids. You don't want that girl. Here's what they say. She's going to end up pregnant or she's going to end up in jail. She's a troublemaker. And they would tell me not to take certain kids. You don't want her. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to come back to you four years from today when I'm sending her off to college. And I'm going to show you what I did with that kid. I would love, and you, you see the success stories. Uh, teachers that just rid kids off. Not any good, troublemakers. And I said, they just hadn't had a great coach. Because when they have a great coach, you're going to see a total 180 in that kid. And I would show them kid after kid. You know, I go back to that teacher and say, remember you told me that kid was going to be pregnant or in jail? She was an All-American this year for us. And she's going to college. She's the first one in her family ever went to college. Right? Because she had a great coach. You gave up on her. You gave up on a 12-year-old. Come on. I mean, how many people, what if somebody gave up on us when we were 12? <laughs> you know what I mean? What if somebody gave up on me when I was in my 20s? I mean, I'd like to race the whole decade almost. So, so my point is, don't give up on a kid. See them for what they can become. For what, see, I see workers for what they can become, not what they are today. Okay? All right, what's yours? Resources and people. Trying to make sure I have enough of them that touches each one of the guys that are under me. Mm -hmm. to making sure they have enough to do what they need to do mm -hmm. without being tied up in a vehicle all the time. Yeah. So, mine is resources and people. Yeah. Is what I'm looking at. Because uh, some of the supervisors here are having to do the work currently. Yes yeah. or no? Yeah, they have to step in. Yeah. yeah. Because the demand is high and there's not enough workers, right? And so you're having to get in there and, and, and do it, okay? 
So you're trying to make sure you got the resources and the people. The resources, the people. Okay. So they can, so they're able to step back. So, so let me ask you this. If you were out there in the world and you did have some talent and potential at all, would you want to come work in a culture that has all that? No. Would that be attractive to you? No. Would you say, hey, sign me up for that? <laughs> right? To attract other people, we must become attractive. There is recruiting and attracting. Recruiting is we're out looking for talent. You know what? I'll go to a restaurant at night, and there'll be a great server, and I'll say, hey, I'm Coach Bert. How you doing? What, you know, do you have a big dream? Do you have a future you want to go to? They're like, yeah, I want to do this. And I'll, I'll grab their hand. I'll say, I want you to come work with me. I recruit people everywhere. I mean everywhere. I recruited nurses. I recruited a nurse that delivered our daughter. I'm like, you're the best customer service rep I have ever seen. Because my wife was in labor for a long time with our daughter. And right toward the very end, they were trying to get her to like, come on, we just need one more push. And then the old coach came out of me and I went, suck it up, let's go. <laughs> Don't ever do that to your wife, okay? <laughs> the old coach in me said that. I'm like, come on, suck it up, one more push. And, 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 and the nurse was like, what did you say? My wife's like, it's exactly what I needed though. I need to hear that, right? Well, that nurse was so good. Let me tell you what she did. All the other nurses checked out. They clocked out when it was their time to check out. So they come to us and said, look, been a good day. Good luck to you. One nurse walked in. She says, it is time for me to check out. My shift is over, but I started this with you, and I'm going to finish it with you. Wow. She stayed three hours after her shift. You wow. think I'll ever forget that woman? So I went back and tried to hire her. I said, look, that's your work ethic. She could have went home. Everybody else went in, time up. She had her own family. She said, I started this with you at 6 o'clock this morning, and I will stay here until we have that baby. And that told me something about that woman. She said, I want you to come work with me because that's the kind of people I'm looking for. You with me? So, so I want you to think recruiting is there's people out there in dead-end jobs that they hate, right, that are dying to come work with somebody that will just talk to them and spend time with them. And they're everywhere. 67% of United people in the United States say they're disengaged with their work. You know what they're doing? Just enough not to get fired. They're looking for somebody to come along and go, hey, come work with me. Right? How many of you have ever stayed in a job, not because of the job, but because of the manager? Because of a relationship with a person. Right? I have. I've worked with certain companies because of my relationship with one person. Even when other companies would pay me more money. So, so people don't leave their jobs many times. They leave their bosses, their manager. They leave their direct supervisor. They don't like how they get treated by their direct supervisor. So they may, I've heard people say, I love the work, like being outside, like, like it, but I don't like how I get treated by my manager. Right? So as a coach, my first three years, I motivated through fear. And I didn't win any championships because the players resented me. Although I was teaching them all this good stuff, there was constant friction between me and the player. It was adversarial, right? Then I shifted when I was about 25, when I started writing these books, I'm like, man, these people are the geese laying the golden eggs. I need to have a good relationship with them. I need to figure out how they would run through that wall for me. And so I, ch I started shifting the way I coached, the way I talked to them, the way I spent time with them, the way I built them up versus tore them down. And man, that's when we really started to win, right? Because I understood your employees are the geese laying the golden eggs. Do you believe that? If there is an adversarial relationship between you and your employee, they will never fight for you. Yes? So it never should be us and them. No, no. Because here's the deal. If, I mean, let's say I get up every day and I resent, resent you and I come to work with you and I... How, see, go back to what I said earlier. Now, here's the point, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you... What I'm trying to say here is once you understand this, see, I can show up to work and only be here in the body, okay? And, and so what I mean is, what good is it for me to show up and I don't think and I don't care and I don't believe in what we're doing? I'm just here. Could I quit and still show up, yes or no? Could I, could I quit on you and still show up and work every day, yes or no? Yes, for the paycheck. So I'm not here because I want to be here. 
I'm not here because I care about it. I'm not here because I'm engaged. I'm here because I need the money. So you got me in the body, but you don't have me in the mind and heart and spirit. How can we talk about potential and not talk about all these parts? So early on, I would push the players so hard they quit on me. But they'd still show up because they wanted to play. So here's what it looked like. They'd give half effort. I'd get mad at them. I'd yell and scream and cuss and everything coaches do. And they would just quit on me. They'd go out there and get beat and go, we don't care. We don't care if we win or lose. You see teams do this all the time to their coaches. Eric, how many times did you see coaches in the SEC where the players quit on the coach? Yes. They just quit. They still show up because they want the scholarship. They still go through the motions because mom and daddy wants them to play. But, but, but that's not, that you don't win championships like that. So then I go, how can I get these people to fight for me? I mean like fight for me. Well, I got to get in the boat with them. I got to believe in them. I got to spend time with them. I got to, I got to, you know what I'm saying? I got to, I got to like, they're the geese laying the golden eggs, right? And when I made that shift, it went from me versus them. I see this all the time, employers versus employees. Manager versus workers. You see what I'm saying? And that's not the kind of relationship. Now, what you got to know is you can lead like that. You know, you can lead with a two-by-four or the metaphor. But the more you leave, the, the people you're managing today are not tough enough to handle it. Yes or no? They're not tough enough. We are such an emotionally soft society today. If I coach, if I went back and coached today like I did 15 years ago, they'd put me in jail. You understand what I'm saying? I would be in jail today if I coached like I used to coach. Because they can't take it. I'd be in lawsuits because the kids can't take it. Back in those days, man, they were tough. So, so what I'm telling you, though, is those kids are now your employees. Everybody with me? They are not as tough as you are. They do not have the fight that you have. They do not have the emotional toughness. So if you have an adversarial relationship with your employees right now, you can continue down this road if you want to, but you're going to get very minimal production. And they're going to undermine you and backstab you and talk about you behind your back. They're going to build alliances against you. They're going to be cutting drama all day long. They will not go to bat for you, which is exactly what you want them to do, yes or no? Yes. Content cows give more milk, guys. You give, a, you give a cow a name, you know it produces 6% more milk than a cow without a name? That's a good one. Jack, have you heard that one? I know that. I know that. Is that true or not? There you go. See? Milk, cheese. They got cows. My point is, your employees are the cows. They give more milk. Content cows always give more milk. Okay? So, so part of building a culture, at least what I've tried to build in my organization, is I want my people to show up to work and say, man, I love working with that guy. He makes me better. He pushes me, he challenges me, he holds me accountable, but he's got very high expectation. They did a poll in the NFL and they asked, if you could play for any coach, which coach would you play for? 26% of the players said Pete Carroll, the Seahawks. Because he's a player's coach. But they ask his players, does that mean that he's soft? Like you see him smiling and laughing and joking and having fun and hitting them on the back, and, you know what I'm saying? It's like he's easy. They ask his players and they said, don't for one second believe that he's easy. He is one of the most disciplined, structured people you will ever find. His expectations are incredible for people. But he says, I'm going to have fun coaching these people. They're going to love playing for me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. See, you watch him coach, and you, like you watch Saban coach, and you think, man, I'd be miserable playing for that guy. <laughs> I've never seen somebody, somebody so unhappy when they, when they win as Saban. <laughs> He's winning a national championship and he's mad because he's in a national championship game. Because he's during the national championship game that he just won, they asked him a question. He says, I'm, Well, I'm really mad because it's costing me time for re be on the recruiting trail. <laughs> <laughs> I would have be like working with that guy. But here's Saban's philosophy. When you go work for Saban, he says this Your paycheck is your thank you. Don't ever expect one from me. You're never going to hear me tell you good job. You're, when you get paid, that's how my, my way of thanking you. If you don't like it, go work somewhere else. He's not a guy that's going to pat you on the back. Right? But he tells you up front, so you got to give him credit. But what, what's an apprenticeship like working under Saban? How does that set you up for a future job? So a lot of people go, look, I can suffer through this for three or four years to learn under the, the Jedi Master. Right? Right or wrong? So, so you can't discount what he's doing. It's work for him. I'm not that way. 
okay? It, so that don't work for me. But, but what works for you? So, but, but I made up my mind, I want my people fighting for me. Even when I'm not there, I want them fighting for me. You got to make up your mind. Do, do you want to be a leader that, that, that wants to work for you? It has to work for you. What kind of leader do you want to be? Okay, all right, finish this up in the back. Then we'll take a break. What do you think your biggest, right now, the biggest thing you're fighting? How long have those guys been with you? Well, I've only been doing this probably about a year now. Okay. So there's a lot of new people in here. I've been there years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been in the city for about three years. We've been there yep. longer than I have. Yep. But there does get to be complacent. complacent yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Uh, but for the most part, it's a good group, in my opinion. I mean, we're all over. Well, you said something I want to show a graphic to is that this three states, you talked about complacency. You can be complacent at any level, at any age in life. Complacency is a gradual settling to a place of mediocrity. You, you ever send your kid off to school and say, hey, go gradually settle to a place of mediocrity today? <laughs> right? What do you say? Go get it. But we, we gradually settle. So here's the three states I want you to think of. And every, like your, your little team is in one of these three states right now. You are dynamic. That means you're growing. You're excited. You're alive. You're vibrant. You're energetic. It is dynamic. Now here's the beauty of dynamic. It's attractive. People want to be around dynamic people. You follow me? They want to be a part of it. It's exciting. But what happens is, then we move to a state of static. Static is, give me some other words for static. Steel, not moving, friction, complacent, stuck in a rut, uh, apathetic, bored, average. So what happens is we grow and then we become static. This happens to a lot of adults. We should become bored. Get up, hey, you eat banana pudding every day for 10 years, you eventually get tired of eating it. You know, people ask me why I retired at 31 years old. I was bored. What more do you want me to do? Came in, built a culture, won a championship. What do you want me to do? Come back and do it again? Took me, took me 10 years and 80-hour work weeks to do it. I was personally bored. I was like, there's something bigger I'm supposed to be doing on planet Earth. This is no longer enough for me. I'm not, I'm not being emotionally satisfied here. And I was at the peak of my game. So I, what I try to do is never allow myself to get static. And the way I, I don't allow myself to get static is I set bigger goals. So when I start getting bored, I set big, huge, juicy goals that, I, that scare me, quite frankly. <laughs> right? And, and I say your goals ain't big enough if somebody's not trying to take them away from you or keep you from getting them. Your goals are too small if, if people don't care if you reach them or not. You come in and really shake it up, people's going to get mad about it which means they're trying to keep you from reaching your goals. Look at the last three presidential elections, 51-49. That means 51% was for, 49 against, right down the middle, all three. Right? President Bush, President Obama, President Trump. That means half the population were against them. So what's the lesson there? You can become president of the United States with 50% of people against you. Yes or no? Yeah. And here's, here, those people don't care. What do they care? They don't care because they know until you really start doing something and saying something, you're not going to meet any opposition. You only attract haters when you actually start doing something. <laughs> you're right? So, so here's what happens, though, is my definition of power is a means or source for supplying energy. See, I want my manager to be a source of power. 
You're a means or source for supplying energy. Some days I don't show up with all my energy and I got to borrow some from you because okay. I ain't operate at your level. And I want to, but I ain't got your skill set, right? So, so when you think about this, if we, if we get out of a static state, we move into an entropic state. And I'll close on this and let you take a break. My grandfather, his whole life was dynamic. Worked with his hands, owned a cabinet shop, sold cattle, was a little entrepreneur, built houses. This is old school. Like he built all my mom, her sister's houses, the whole house. I ain't talking about subcontract people. I'm talking about him, build it, right? I mean, stuff is just unheard of today. And I'm like, you did the plumbing? And he's like, yeah, electrical, yep. Built the house, yeah. Well, he loved what he did for a living. He got up every day and worked his hands and he built things that he was proud of. And he was always in a dynamic state. He was always happy and engaged and excited. And then he retired. And my mother told me, she said to me one day something I'll never forget. She said, it's almost as if the day after your grandfather retired, every bit of his health went downhill. His mind, his body, he skipped this stage. He went straight from being alive and vibrant to dying. And you know why? Not engaged, not pursuing something, no purpose, no reason to get out of bed in the morning. So see, we've been sold a big lie in the United States. And the government created this, by the way. The government created the concept of retirement. You do know that, right? We're going to work to a certain age, and then what are we going to do? We're going to retire and then die. Right? I told my dad. My dad just retired from working in a factory. I said, look, three weeks, you're going to be bored out of your mind. There's only so much fishing you can do. There's only so much sitting. There's only so much going to the casino on the weekend you're going to want to go to. Listen, you're going to wake up in a few weeks, and you're going to call your son, and you're going to ask me, can I drive the bus for you? You're going to be wanting to do something. Trust me. You're 52, 55 years old. You got a whole lot of left. I mean, I don't think you're really even getting started to 50. I don't even think you even figure anything out until 50, right? You hear what I'm saying? So I see a lot of people work, 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 and then they think, man, I'm going to shut it down, do nothing, play golf, relax, go eat coffee every day. Let me tell you something. This is not a good formula. I'm not saying you got to get up and do what you do every day right now, but you don't ever need to retire to do nothing. You need to retire to do something. I mean, it, you know, whether you like Trump or not, guy's 70 years old. <laughs> 70. I was with a physician yesterday in Houston, Texas, 72, and he had more energy than me. He's 32 years older than me. And this guy's just, I'm like, man. He's, but, but you know, his, but he's got a big mission in life. He wants to affect 3 million people in his lifetime. You see what I'm saying? So he's got a big thing that gets him up out of bed every morning. So for you, your, your organization is in one of these three places too. Y'all are dynamic, you're static, or you're entropic. And it's all related on one word, energy. Your energy's high, it's medium, or it's nothing. Does that make sense? So if you're trying to build a, a, an organization with your team, you're trying to build something dynamic. And dynamic means energy. And energy is attractive. And people want to be part of it. Okay? And so, you know, I, I hope this first session was good for you to get you thinking. Okay? Because i got to get you thinking. You're not just supervisors. There's no, no offense to that. But you're not just people that show up and make sure nobody hurts themselves and hurts each other. You follow me? What I really need you doing is thinking I'm in the business of building people. I'm in the business of, I'm a master of human potential. I'm a coach. I'm going to take a team and perform at a very high level. And when you start thinking like that, man, it's going to, this thing's going to rock and roll for you, okay? Give me, give me yours. Which is all low, low energy, right? Low wasted energy. 
Now, when you think about this, I want you to start getting your mind around this, okay? Is that, can I be an island of excellence in a sea of mediocrity? Why not? No. Here's, here's one thing I say a lot. Man, I've been drawing a lot up here. <laughs> There's two things you hear me say a lot. Never allow another person to stand between you and your destiny. Anytime you put your destiny in another person's hands, you're in trouble. Everybody with me? And no thing, nothing, no thing has to happen for you to get started. Right? So I made up my mind at Riverdale, I was going to be an island of excellence. We had a very mediocre culture at Riverdale. Student population, the teachers. I wouldn't send my daughter there. You understand what I'm saying? I made up my mind that my little organ, my little place at Riverdale was going to be the most, was going to be the best place in the world. And everybody was going to want to know what we were doing. And I didn't, look, it, I wasn't in charge of the biology department. I wasn't in charge of the English department. I was in charge of my shop. And I made up my mind that I was going to build an island of excellence. And I didn't care what other departments did. Because I wasn't in charge of them. Now, when you're in a culture that's static and, and negative and all those things, which the only thing you can control, and I learned this from Covey, he called it a, a circle of concern. I don't know why. I don't know why people would make a yellow marker. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, kind of like those yellow shirts y'all got on. So, so here's what Covey said. Stephen Covey, and he wrote the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, "There's a circle of concern." of things that you are concerned about, but you can do nothing to change. Everybody with me? Like, I really don't have a lot of impact over this. Then he said there are things you can't control. Where you need to focus all your time and energy, right there. Because what happens is it begins to expand. So this is almost a serenity prayer. Have you ever heard the serenity prayer? God, give me the strength to know what I can change, what I can't change, right? What, what he's basically saying here is don't spend all your time here. So when you spend all your time here, what do you do? You talk about things you got no control over, right? If they did this, if they did this, if they did this, if they did this, if the mayor of, you know, the city of Franklin would do this, if the police department would do this, if they'd do this, you know, it, what you're doing is letting other people stand between you and your destiny, right or wrong. I ain't in charge of those departments. I'm in charge of my department. So I really, when he said that, I was like, man, it's good. And anytime I hear a person during the day griping about something, I'm like, you can't control that. Move on. You can't control it. Some people are going to like you. Some people are not going to like you. So what? Keep on moving. Okay? So I try to focus right here. That's my control. This is something I can influence right here. None of this. So the reason I say that is because I want to encourage you to, to build your own little island of excellence in a sea of mediocrity. Now, a mistake I made that I don't want you to make, this is the biggest mistake of my 20s, professionally. I had a lot of mistakes from 20 to 30, personally. <laughs> <laughs> One was I had little or no spiritual guidance from 20 to 30, and I regret that. I regret that I didn't have spiritual guidance from 20 to 30, because that's when you make a lot of bad decisions. But professionally, I didn't have a lot of guidance either. So one mistake I made is I became so consumed with my, that I was callous and did not care about other people's stuff. So what I mean is I focused so intensely on my program that I, didn't, I was not an ambassador for anybody else's program. I didn't care if the football team was winning or the softball team or the soccer team. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's selfish. So young head coaches, when I counsel young head coaches, and they say, hey, what's the biggest mistake you made at Riverdale? I said, if I had to go back and do it again, I would have been the biggest ambassador for everybody. I would have loved on the soccer team and the football team, and I would have supported them. I was too selfish and self-absorbed and consumed in my own program that I didn't care about, in your world, the other departments. Does that make sense? And because of that, I got a lot of hate toward me that I could have changed. 
I didn't have to be that polarizing. I could have went out there and been, been, been said, hey, I'm going to help your department, I'm going to help your department. And then the last two years I became the athletic director and you should have seen the petty arguments that I listened to in a day between departments. Football coach won't let the soccer coach on the football field because he's afraid to tear the so soccer coach gets mad at the football coach. Baseball coach can't get a lawnmower to mow his yard, but the principal gave the football coach a $15,000 lawnmower. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? And I would listen to this all day long as the athletic director, and I would say, why don't we just bring the kids in here because they got more sense than y'all do. The kids don't even argue about these things. And I would listen to this. That's where I spent most of my time listening to petty grievances between adults. And I would say, you are being so selfish. All you worry about is you. You're not even thinking about this. You don't even care about them. Why can't you two just work together? I mean, that's what I would say. I, was, I, I mean, I didn't even want to do it after two years. I mean, it's ridiculous. But that was me from 20 to 30. I didn't care about anybody else. Don't matter, don't matter if it affects you or not. That's selfish. So, so I tell you, that's a mistake I don't want you to make. Right? Like I work with your Parks and Recreation Department here. Everybody goes out every day and fights a good fight, yes or no? Everybody fights it in their own way, but you all fight the good fight every day. So there ain't any room for sitting around complaining about everybody else. Could the other departments do things better? Yes. They could probably say, well, y'all could do things better too. So I just, we all wearing the same uniform, city of Franklin. Franklin is one of the coolest cities in the world to live in, by the way. Do you know that? I go all over the world and people love, people talk to me all the time about Franklin. Hey, where do I need to live in now? I got somebody coming in from Las Vegas next week and he's looking at houses all over Franklin. This is one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth to live. Right? It's, it's safe. It's got good people. If you travel like I do, I was going to New Jersey once a month. Okay? I didn't carry a handgun with me every time I went up there. Because it ain't safe in New Jersey. I couldn't walk out. In, I, I, I would be in a hotel and they'd say, look, you don't need to walk up down the streets here. Hmm. There's places in Jersey that you don't even want to step out and go to. Not all places because there's beautiful places in Jersey. Right? But some of the places I was at, it's like, man, it's not safe here. I don't ever feel that way for the most part when I'm in Franklin. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a beautiful thing. Finish this up, big guy. We're talking about the biggest... Well, like what I was saying, was the, was the, the drama queens. Yeah. Starting drama. Constantly starting drama. Yeah. We're working on it, though. We've got a new coach now. Yeah. And I see things... Changing? Stepping up. Okay, good. Changes are being made and attitudes are getting better. Good. And, and, and listen, toxic cultures have been allowed to stay toxic for so long. One of my favorite uh, scriptures in the Bible is, is Jesus walking up to the, at the pool of Bethesda and the person that's been crippled for 38 years is laying there. And the very first thing Jesus asked him is, hey, do you want to be made well or not? It's almost like he's saying, look, can you, can, can you not get somebody to just roll you over into the pool? <laughs> right? He's basically like, look, if you want to, make, if you want to be made well, get in... Get, get yourself in the pool. Well, here's the moral of that story, though. The moral of that story is you can, you can be toxic for 38 years and it becomes normal. You can be drama queens and drama kings for so many years it becomes normal until somebody walks in and goes, this, this is not normal. This is abnormal. You understand what I'm saying? Do you want to be made well? Yes or no? Because this has become... Average to you. This is the this is the cost of this is just the way it is. And sometimes we accept things for so long until another person comes in and goes, "This ain't the way it's supposed to be." We can change this, okay? And that's really some of the moral of that story: yeah. is you can be made well if we can get you in that pool. Absolutely. You know why you're fighting against you're fighting against the, the you're fighting against the norms. You're, you're, your people are scared to death of change. Change is one of the best things in the world can ever happen to you. So, good first session, guys. We're going to take a break right now, let your brains rest for a second. And then when we come back, we're going to get into, we're going to get into a little bit about the crumbs concept because not only do we give our family crumbs sometimes, we give each other crumbs. Okay, and I'll explain how this concept plays in. This is a book I'm working on that will be coming out at some point in the future. I first have to master it before I feel qualified to write a book on it. Okay, so let's take a short break. Give me some, give me some aha, some takeaways. <laughs> That's right. Unless they're paying you a lot of money to go. Yeah. Right? The, the working together thing, because we had a, another person before that had kind of coached us, it was like that 
you and them. Yeah. So working together makes yep. a whole lot more sense to me than. Well, just remember, think about how hard when you have an adversarial relationship with someone. How hard, how how much do you fight for them? Yep. See. The reason you need to remember content cows give more milk. The reason you need to remember that they, you're the employees are the geese laying the golden eggs, you know, is because when you begin building our, that adversarial relationship, and this happens a lot with coaches and players, because the coach is trying to get the player to do something they don't want to do. Mm-hmm. So, so the, more, the harder I push you until I build a strong enough relationship with you, you don't trust me enough to go do it as, because it's, you don't think it's in your best interest. You think there's advantages to me, that I'm manipulating you to get something I want. So, so I went down to Vanderbilt. Here's a good example. I went down. They hired me to come to Vanderbilt to work with the women's basketball coach at, at Vanderbilt. And great, incredibly smart woman, X and O genius. But when I got there, there was a huge division between the players and the coaches. So I said, I want to meet with him separately. So I sit and talk to the players. Guess what they do? Talk about the coaches. Don't trust them. Don't believe in them. Right? Talk to the coaches. What do they say? Here's the phrases I would hear. They need to get on my system. They need to grow up. They need to mature. You know what I'm saying? Right? So they were just like this, division. And so I go to the head coach, and I'm like, look, you're never, they're paying you a million dollars a year to win. Would you like to keep that million dollars? Because if you don't work this out, you're going to get fired. It's just a matter of time. And the reason you're going to get fired is because you're not going to win. Right? And I would hear phraseology like, well, they need to grow up. And so that one day I asked her this question. How many years have you been coaching? Well, I spent 15 years at Xavier. Then I spent, see what I'm saying? I mean, she's been doing this 20, 25 years. Mm-hmm. And I said, you're, you're, you're telling me that you're expecting an 18-year-old to know the same things you know. You're here, and they're here. And you're mad at them because they can't figure out how to get from here to there. So you can either keep this friction between you and them, and you stay here and be mad at them, and them stay here and be mad at you, and y'all continue losing, and they're unhappy, and you're unhappy, and you're going to get fired. They're still going to get their education at Vanderbilt. You're going to be out of a job. Or you can come and meet them where they are and try to bring them up to your level. Make sense? Mm-hmm. So, th- so that they never really closed that gap. Even after I left, I was there for two years trying to help them, and t- they made some progress. And guess what? Vanderbilt fired her. So she lost the head coaching job. She's now an assistant or associate head coach at Texas Tech, which means she worked for somebody else. <laughs> she don't have her own program now. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. My point was we can avoid this. If we just figure out how to get you two on the same page with each other, we can avoid all of this. And my, my real point was you are a genius. I mean, that woman was a genius. But when it comes to her people skills with those players, it was not working. Now, if I try to give her counsel, because it's very critical, if I'm trying to coach you, and every time I give you counsel, you're defensive, argumentative, or you make excuses, how can I really help you? You see what I'm saying? So, she, so as I'm giving her counsel, let's just say, she said, there and said, no, not my fault. I've been doing this 20 years. I'm good at what I do. Right? It don't matter how good you are if you can't get that group of people to do what you want them to do. That was my point. I'm unbiased here. I don't bring any bias to this equation. I'm telling you because I believe in you and I think you're great at what you do, but until you can get those people, it don't matter how good you are, okay? So, so my point was there was all these little things that I did as a coach, and, I'm, 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 and I'm, I've got to get better at doing this with my employees because I'm tough. I'm tough to work with. I'm t- tough to work for. I push people really hard. We work long hours. You know, I had pe- my team members were on the plane with me last night at 11.30, coming from Houston. You see what I'm saying? We started yesterday at 7 a.m., and they still weren't home at 11 o'clock last night. And they were back at the office this morning at 7.30. So I'm not easy to work with but because I have very high expectations. But what I'm trying to do is take the best things I did when I was a coach was spend one-to-one time with each player. So what I would do is after every practice, I would say, hey, take a walk with me. 
and I'd pick one player and I'd say, let's go out to the football stadium and let's just walk. And I would ask them questions. How's it going? How's your family? What can I do to be a better coach? You know what I mean? And man, you would be shocked at how that one conversation changed our relationship. And then if I really want to get information on I gave them ice cream. Okay? <laughs> if they were sick or something, I was like, let's, I'm like, let's go down to Sonic and have some ice cream. Man, they'd tell me everything. But, but, but I learned that, I learned that from, from a professor I had in college that I was very disengaged in her class. Didn't care about the class, didn't care about the subject, sat in the back, totally disengaged. And one day after class, she called me and she said, can I walk you to your next class? And I was like, what? No professors ever walked me to my next class. And she said, I know. Can I walk you, can I just talk to you on your way to your next class? And I said, sure. And she's like, what can I do to be a better professor for you? She's like, I notice you're disengaged. What can I do to help you learn? And man, that one conversation changed the dynamic of our relationship. So the very next day I went to class, I sat on the front row, and I dug in with that woman. And I became a great student because she invested time and energy into me, and no other professor did that. So what's the lesson for you? We need to be spending more one-to-one -one time with our employees. I do, you do, because until they buy into you, the messenger, they're not buying into the message that you send them. When they buy into you, as a man, as a woman, when they buy into you first, then they will be open and receptive to what you're giving them. And until then, this adversarial relationship's never gonna work, I'm telling you. It's never gonna work. And that's part of the reason you have a toxic culture that you've been, is because there's too much adversarial relationships, right or wrong. And you don't feel like you're on a team. You feel like you're you know, all out there fighting. And so it, it's breeding this toxic culture. And here's the deal. It's hard enough to get up and go show up every day and deliver the goods, let alone not want to come to work and have to do it because you don't like the culture, you don't like the people, you don't want to be around that. So you got to start working on that, okay? All right, so that was one big takeaway. What's another takeaway? Okay, yeah. Catch yourself. Catch yourself. When you start whining, complaining about things you can't do anything about, you need to catch yourself and go, no, no, no. There's a waste of time and energy right here. Go to work on what you can control. Too many people, so here's, here's an example of letting another person stand between you and your desk. Well, when the city of Franklin does this, I'll work harder. When they do this, I'll do this. When they do this, they do this. When I get better workers, I'll be a better boss. When I get better this, something's always gotta happen for you to change. No thing has to happen for you to take action on anything in your life. Everybody with me? No thing, nothing. I hear this all the time. These are, just, these are simple excuses. Nothing has to happen for you to be what you're capable of becoming. So, so in a few weeks, have you got in touch with Tim Grover's person yet? Tim Grover, you still working on her? I am working on her. Okay. okay. Be relentless with her. Because Tim Grover wrote a book called Relentless. He was Michael Jordan's personal coach. Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and I'm having him on my podcast here in a few weeks. And he's tough, man. This is the guy that Jordan would go to after. I mean, play for Phil Jackson and he still had a personal coach. So he, Jordan would play a game and not like his performance. It don't matter if he scored 45 points. If he didn't like something he did, he would call Grover and say, I'll meet you at the gym at 2.30 in the morning. And they'd work on one move for hours. And so I'm talking to Tim Grover and I'm like, tell me one thing about Jordan that nobody knows. And he said, Jordan had two scorecards. The scorecard they measured him by and the scorecard he measured himself by. And if he was not satisfied with his own personal scorecard, it didn't matter if he scored 45 points that night and they won by 30. He was so relentless in his, pers in his own potential. He said, look, I've coached people a lot better than Jordan, a lot better, more athletic, a lot quicker, a lot stronger. But Jordan's relentless pursuit toward his potential. So I operate on two scorecards. And what I mean by that is I have my scorecard I'm supposed to hit for my company, which I own my goals, then I have my own scorecard over here, which is am I operating in my full capacity that I'm capable of? And my wife don't know my potential, and my daughter don't know my potential, and my mama don't know my potential. Nobody knows my potential except me. Everybody with me? So when I'm clicking on every cylinder, I know it. When I'm not clicking on every cylinder, I know it. Okay, so what, so what I'm telling you is, you know whether you click it on every cylinder, and, that, and you can't control that. Okay, anything else? that we took away from the first session?
think it was on the heart or the, the spirit or maybe a combination. Yep. Body, mind, heart. <clears throat> um, you're, 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 you're genuinely, like you have confidence. It's like you genuinely know, you know this is the right thing to do or you know this is, you know this is going to be worth it to get to the goal or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and you should, if you really do believe that, it's going to come through mm -hmm. instead of, I mean, you should, That's right. if there's something wrong, if you feel like you're faking it or yes. it's not That's right. coming up from inside you. Okay, good. You know? All right. So you, I'm going to tell you like my buddy, Tim Story told me, Tim Story's called the comeback coach. He's out in California. And he told me he, he, he helps people that have fallen off the wagon, celebrities. So he coached Robert Downey Jr., Tiger Woods. Um, he said, if you see them on TMZ, they're most likely my clients. <laughs> but, but he's become a specialist at helping a person come back. Drug addiction, alcoholism, lost all their confidence, lost their, you see what I'm saying? That's what he specializes in, okay? So he's got a little niche. So, so, real interesting guy. And he said, to your point, that there's three things. First, we have revelation. This is just a big aha moment. Right? It's like, okay, I get it. I've had a vision of something. We've all had those, right? This revelation, bam, hit you. Like my, one of my big revelations, look, when I wrote this book, Big revelation is, hey, this ain't no practice life. Big revelation is, everybody needs a coach in life. Big revelation is, let's not give crumbs to the people we love the most. You see what I'm saying? These are big revelations. Well, as a result of that, we have conviction. Conviction is, I believe it in my bones. And this is really what you're selling your team. Do you, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that the sanitation department serves a vital and necessary role in, the, in the, the, the health and wealth and progress of the city of Franklin, yes or no? Absolutely. Yes. It's not something that's like, hey, we don't have to fool with it. We don't have to worry about it. We can get rid of it. It is a vital component in the health and beautification and aesthetics and everything of a, of a society. So what you're doing is, see, you, that's the sale you gotta make to your employees. We're not just picking up trash. We're not just cleaning up. We're, this is critical, right? We have one of, the, one of the most beautiful places on the planet to live. And until you travel to other places, you don't get that. We have it. Part of our stewardship with the planet is protecting it, taking care of it. So you, you're doing a whole lot more than just cleaning up some trash. You are helping us to preserve, right? That's a whole lot bigger reason to get up in the morning. Like I was speaking at a nurses conference once and, and my mom's a nurse so I was like, you know, what do you do for a living? And I, and I knew they were nurses. I'm like, what do you do for a living? And she's like, I'm a nurse. I'm like, duh. It's a nurses conference. I know that. What do you really do for a living? And she's like, I'm a nurse. And I'm like, no, no, no. Why do you wake up in the morning to do this? And she got kind of frustrated because I was pushing her. And she stood up and she said, look, I help people when they hurt, Okay. And I'm like, that's a big reason to wake up. I said, what kind of nurse are you? Emergency room nurse, great. Do you help people some of the worst times of their life? Yes, I do. You see what I'm saying? I said, that's a whole lot bigger reason than just saying you're a nurse. So being in the sanitation business is a whole lot bigger reason to say we clean up trash and we do this and wait, blah, blah, blah. What we really do, the reason we really do is this. This is what we really do here. And it's a vital component. So first you got revelation, then you got conviction. And then you take action or movement. So I'm going to call action here. Well, you can't take, have conviction and take action unless you had revelation about something. <laughs> right? Or when you're selling it, you can't sell it. You can't sell it to your employees because you don't believe it yourself. Ziegler always said you can't sell the cookware if what? If you don't buy the cookware. You can't sell the cookware if you don't buy the cookware. So do you believe it or not? I believe everybody needs a good coach in life. I believe a good coach can change your life. I believe it with every bone in my body. So I have no problem selling that to people. With a good coach, you're going to perform at much higher levels. 
And I believe it. So I'm selling my conviction of this. Because of that, I take action. Okay? And if I don't have this, I'm in a static state. Because I don't have any conviction, I'm not taking action. What you're really doing is reclaiming, reclaiming a division and department here. Right? It's important. All right, so let's talk about this concept. I'm sitting at dinner one night. My beautiful wife, you ever see my wife? I've got a beautiful wife. And she married me for my confidence, not for my looks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I got a beautiful wife, a great partner in life. We got a beautiful five year old daughter, four and a half year old daughter, be five uh, next week. And we're sitting at dinner with another couple on Saturday night. You know, when you're married and you got a five year old, you only get about one date night a month, if that. You know what I'm saying? And so we go out to dinner with another couple, and he's my banker. And I buy. Uh, real estate. I buy lots of real estate. Short term, long term, commercial. I build buildings. And so that's just something I've been doing over the last six, seven, ten years. And so I got a good banker. And the banker, you know, finances my deals. And so we're good friends, but he's unbelievable. And he's, man, he's a driver. He is, I mean, a, he's a hard worker. He wants to be the best banker in the world. He's incredibly savvy. And so we're having dinner one night. And uh, we, we, everything's relaxed. Everybody's having fun. Everything's just, we're just having a nice conversation. And then we get into a discussion about, in essence, being married to your work. You're married, but you're really married to your work. And then this conversation kind of takes a turn that I didn't want it to go in. And his wife says to him, Ronnie, let's just be honest. Let's call it what it is. Let's call it what it really is. What you give us and our kids is crumbs, leftovers. Now, I'm not, I'm not complaining because I realize that's who you are. You want to perfect. You want to be awesome. But at the end of the day, you have given your clients so much energy and your work so much energy that you ain't got any leftover for us. So she says that across the table, and as soon as she does... You know, where my wife starts looking. My wife's like. <laughs> right? Now they're teaming up on us. And she's like, you give me crumbs too. And I'm like, well, well sometimes you give me crumbs, right? But, 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 but this is a, if, if, this is, but, but, but as, the, here's what's happening. The demand is increasing on your time, on your energy, on your emotional Right? Y'all are already understaffed and probably overworked. Everybody follow me here? But that's no different. Eric would tell you he's overworked. I'm overworked. Jack's overworked. My bus driver's overworked. You understand what I'm saying? What's happening is the world is happening at such a pace that we cannot keep up with the demand. Okay? Nobody can. Even if we go hire more people, it don't matter. There's going to be more, and there's going to be more. So, so what's happening is this is creating an enormous emotional tax on us. So what we do is we wake up and we put a bunch of energy into our work during the day, typically for strangers, only to go home at the end of the day and have nothing left over for the people we love the most. Okay? How can I give my daughter anything last night when I get home at 11.30 and she's asleep? And I get up, at, I, was, I was at the gym this morning at 5.30 with my trainer. I leave at 6.45. I get to see my daughter for 10 minutes. Right? So, so this, this becomes a big issue. And so what I'm saying is, what I've been studying to write this book is how do, how do you go out, like I was looking at my predictive index I was looking at my predictive index that I took the other day, which is basically a predictor. Let's see if I got it with me, because it, it, it helps you. It's a predictor of your behavior based on your personality. Okay? So I want you to listen to this. This, this, this is me. I want to see who identifies with this. Intense proactivity and aggressiveness and driving to reach goals. Actively and boldly challenges the world. 
his business and others. Strongly independent, putting forth his ideas. Incredibly strong sense of urgency. He is in nearly constant motion, putting pressure on both himself and others for immediate results. Unable to do routine work. <laughs> okay, makes decisions and takes bold action. Independent, proactively connects to others. Comfortably fluid and fast talker. In volume, collaborative. This, this, is, this is how God made, this is who I am. Everybody with me? Now come in and tell me, slow down. Come in and tell me, hey, take a break. Relax. Here's what I tell you. I don't know how. This is who I am. Now, how many other people are like this in some ways? Right? Now, here's the problem. How do you slow down during the work day so when you get home at night you got some left over? Because I don't know how to slow down. Because when I come today and give you, you paid me to be here, I'm going to give you everything I got. And when I leave you, I'm going to go give somebody else everything I got. And when I leave there, I'm going to give somebody else everything I got because that's the only way I know how to do it. Well, what happens is you get me home about 6 o'clock tonight and my daughter, who's five years old, is going to say, let's go play ball, let's go ride a bike, let's go to the play park. What am I going to be doing? Too tired. <laughs> I'm an old man, baby. Mm -hmm. Getting old sucks. Is that fair to my daughter? Is it fair to my wife? So you see how big this concept is? But what about this? We not only give crumbs to, to our... We also give crumbs to each other. I show up tired today, burn out. So I want you to remember these three states. Rejuvenated, mechanical, burnout. Okay? So these are the three states we're always in. Man, this is going to be a big concept, Jack. I feel a bestseller coming on. <laughs> I feel a bestseller, Jack. The only reason I haven't written this book yet is because I'm not qualified to write it. I told my wife I was going to write a book on uh, active listening. She said, you don't know nothing about active listening. <laughs> If anybody's going to write that, it's going to be me. Rejuvenated, mechanical, burnout. Dynamic, static, entropic. Everybody see that? So let me ask this question. If I burn your engine for too long in mechanical mode, what happens to you? You burn out. Burnout is the loss of joy or passion. Loss of all joy or passion for something. So what happens is if I run your engine for too long and, I, and, I'm, and I'm going too hard and that engine eventually does what? It's no different than your car when you don't change the oil. You burn that engine for too long and then when you walk up they say what? I'm out. I tell my team this all the time. What are y'all going to do when I walk in one day and say I don't want to do this anymore? Right? And everything's dependent on the flying monkey showing up and delivering the goods. Right? You don't want me to ever get that like that. I'm telling you. I need time off. I need time away. I need time to rejuvenate. If you don't, because one day I'm going to walk in and go, look, I can make a bunch of money in real estate. I don't need to do this. You understand what I'm saying? I don't have to get up and work this hard. But I love this. So all I say is just give me a little bit of breather time every now and then. Just give me a little bit of time so I can get my mojo. Right? Last night I was supposed to be in at 8.30. I got home at 11.30 because my flights were delayed. I'm sitting on a runway in Houston. And I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And I want to be home. And what I'm saying is when you burn this engine for too long, there's where you end up right there. Burnout is like, I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore. Why did I, why did I leave coaching at 31? Two reasons. I was, I was bored and I was burned out. Why was I burned out? 80 hour work weeks, 10 years. You understand what I'm saying? I was like, I wonder what it would be like not to work on Sunday. <laughs> My first Sunday I didn't work. I didn't even know what to do. I'm like, what do, what do people do? And somebody's like, take a nap. I'm like, yeah, come on, man. <laughs> I ain't taking a nap. But, but my point is, this is what's happening. And so, how many of y'all have ever experienced burnout in something? Yeah. So the way to avoid that is to understand I need, I need, so think about entertainers, athletes. They rest, they practice, they play. They rest, they practice, they play. They do not play every night. The Titans do not play every night. Most of the time they don't even play on Sundays when they're really supposed to play. 
Okay? They show up, but they don't play. Right? I'm an old coach, so I can say things like that. But my point is, if you said, look, I need you to perform seven days a week. I need you to go that hard for four hours, seven straight days. Their bodies couldn't take it. Garth Brooks does not perform seven nights a week. He performs three or four nights. He may do two shows, which is almost unheard of, in a night. I mean, I saw him do seven straight shows, uh, two shows a night for seven straight days at Bridgestone Arena in 2010. Sold every one of them out. Two hours a show. That's amazing. How many entertainers will do that? They come out and perform for an hour and they're done. So, so what I'm telling you, though, is if I say, Garth Brooks, we need, as good as you are, we need you to perform every night for 365 days this year. He would say, can't do it. Can't do it. Body can't do it. Mind can't do it. Emotionally can't do it. Well, what we do is we basically, we're, we're running your engine every day at full capacity. And, and we're not having enough time to rejuvenate. And because we don't have it, rejuvenate means to make young again, by the way. It means to make young again. Feel vibrant, alive, energetic. Well, when I burn your engine too much in mechanical, typically this happens too in companies uh, because the demand is so strong we don't have enough workers. So we're basically having to work you harder because we don't have enough people to do it. Does that make sense? We don't, and you can't just say, hey, we're going to take a day, we're going to take, this, take off this week, you know. You just can't do it. So, you burn that engine, you burn that engine, you burn that engine, you get in mechanical mode. So when you think about it, here, here's the conversation. What does it mean, what does it mean to not give crumbs to the people you love the most? So if I were saying to you, what's a successful day to you? See, I define a successful day to me as the ability to spend an hour with my daughter at night of high impact energy. That means from six to seven at night, I want to be able to spend with my daughter, just me and her doing what she wants to do. She wants to play ball, ride bikes, go to the play park. And if I cannot give her that hour because I poured too much in today, then I feel like today was a failure. It was not a success. Everybody with me? I don't know how you define your day, whether it's a success or not, but that's one way I define mine. So what we got to do to avoid crumbs is we got to actually start with the end product in mind and go, this is what success looks like to me. This is what success looks like to me. At the end of the day, at the end of the week, I, I want to be able to have a great weekend. I want to be able to do my hobbies outside. I want to be able to travel. I want whatever, whatever it is. There's something I want to do. Okay, no crumbs has to do with every single action you take in a day. And let me tell you, so, so when you're thinking about energy, I want you to think of this. So we live in, a, I call it a, a, an emotional tax. Now, let's talk about your energy. When you start your day off, it's like this. This cell phone, I have a Mophie. We need a Mophie for life, E. Yeah, we do. You know what a Mophie is? A Mophie is a, a battery pack that's on my phone that gets charged up separately. And when my phone starts to go dead, I hit a little button back here and it charges it back up to 100%. It's 45 bucks, best investment you'll ever buy. So my phone never goes dead. Because that phone cannot keep up with me during the day. So look, it's already, so I already turned my Mophie on by 1045 this morning. I've already hit it because it was already going low. See what I'm saying? Well, I want you to think of your energy. When you woke up this morning, this was what your energy was. If your energy was here, how many people understand, how many people go home at the end of the day and literally had not one bit of energy left over? You were ready to watch television, eat dinner, and go to bed. <laughs> well, what happened is, if you started your day off on a full tank, this implies that you went to bed last night when you should have. Right? You got up this morning and ate breakfast. That would fuel you. You are well rested and rejuvenated. But my guess is not every person this morning woke up on this battery like this, did they? My battery was about right here when I woke up this morning, or right here. And I fought. I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to work out with my trainer. But I went. And that got my energy up. I didn't want to do it, but I did it. So my energy was kind of like right in here after the gym. 
jump back up a little bit. Now, when you get involved in drama, low energy, negative, arguing, fighting, infighting, what does it do to this battery? Have you ever been in a bad cell phone area where it's sucking the life out of that battery? Right? It's draining it faster, two and three times the rate because it's, it's, it's working so hard. Well, when you get involved in negativity during the day, it is sucking that battery out. What about when you get involved in, in things that are high energy? So, so let's say, let me show you what energy is. Hope this is the lights are in here. Okay. I don't know if that's it or not. There's that. Now, let me show you something. That's low energy. Darkness is low, wasted, negative energy. Everybody see that? Almost makes you want to sleep, doesn't it? <laughs> we got a Mountain Dew back there where you got a sun drop? All right, yeah, yeah. He's trying to give him a little energy boost. Right? So, so here's the deal. I want you to know something. When I do this, I want you to look at what happens. See the difference? Right? Now, let me show you something else. Because I want you to understand what energy is. We can create energy. We can actually create energy. And what I mean by that is, let's just, I want to show you something. Now, when we, let me find something everybody would know. You know, we got some seasoned people in here. <laughs> seasoned is a nice way of saying old, isn't it? <laughs> so let me, let me show you something else that's energy. If we can get this up and going. Okay. Now, that's energy. Light, energy, over, overtakes darkness. Music is energy. Everybody with me? Don't go, don't go dancing on me, big guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to sit still when you got energy in it. See? Now, the reason, I, the reason I show you this is because darkness is low energy. Quiet is low energy sometimes. Music is energy. It's just a transfer of energy. That's why a song can change your mood or disposition. See, I, see there was darkness and I turned light on. Light is higher energy than darkness. That's why light overtakes darkness. Everybody see that? Well, when you're thinking about your energy, what's happening during the day is you start off, you may not even start off with a good battery. Maybe you start right here. You didn't go to bed like you should. You didn't eat breakfast like you should. What, what about if you're rushing to get somewhere in the morning? Does that eat energy, yes or no? Catching every red light, now you're mad. Got an argument with your wife. Got an argument with your kid. Here's the deal. See what's happening? Now, you got no battery, so what do you start doing now? now? Now we're drinking energy drinks. Now we're drinking coffee. Now we're drinking something. Now we're trying to eat some sugar. Now we're trying to do something to get our energy up, but it's just sucking it out of us. So when we get home at the end of the day, it's like, hey, I, ain't, I, don't, even want, I don't even want to talk. Now, here's the problem. You do that for 20 or 30 years, Right? You feel guilty about it. Kids not getting the attention they need. Wife's not getting the attention they need. Husband's not getting the attention he needs. Friends not getting the attention. Too tired to do anything. You want to travel, but you don't travel because you're too tired. Places you want to go, but you can't go because you're too tired. You're just tired all the time. And it basically is just crumbs to everybody. And you start giving crumbs to your coworkers. Don't want to talk. Now I'm a manager. I'm supposed to be coaching you, but I'm too tired to coach you. I don't even want to talk about coaching you. I just want to supervise you, make sure nobody hurts themselves, hurts each other. Don't bother me. Don't bother me. So when you think about this, what I really realized was that I had a poor energy management system. What I, what I realized by going, kind of going through this and starting to teach this more is that, man, I didn't have a good system for managing my energy. And I remember reading a Phil Jackson book. Jackson was a coach of the Bulls and the Lakers. And everybody says to me, well, he, the Lord, he had Jordan, he had Kobe Bryant. Look, the Bulls could not win a championship before Phil Jackson got there. Had the exact same players. The Lakers could not win a championship with Shaquille O'Neal until he got there. Then they win six. So I think if you win 11 rings, there must be something you're doing, right or wrong. It wasn't like a fluke, like he won one. 
He won 11. But so, so here's the deal. I remember reading a book about Phil Jackson, and he talked about how he taught the players to conserve energy throughout the game because it was an 82-game season, and he did not want them to burn out late in the season like so many teams do. So he actually taught them to play at a, a rhythm and a pace. And when they needed to flip it up a few notches, they did. Because he said, we can never win a championship if my players get to the end of the year and they're tired. And in the sports world, we call it peaking out. Is that we peak too early. Right? We peak. Well, when I heard him say that, I'm like, that's a great idea. What if I could still give my audiences great energy, still coach them, but still have mojo when I got home at the, at the end of the night? Okay? What if I could conserve energy? So I believe in playing offense versus defense. So how do you play offense? Give me, give me some ideas of how you can move from... How many of you think right now you're in a defensive posture? Yeah, you show up, you deal with what happens. How do I move from defense to offense? Coordinate. Say again? That's right. So I map out every one of my days. I spend 7 to 15 minutes a night mapping out my day. What time I wake up, what time I finish, the appointments, my key activities. I got a quote for the day, kind of psych myself up. I've got notes. I come into every single day with a plan. Am I on defense or offense? See, I already made up my mind what I'm doing. Here's the deal, though. My goal is not to let you or anybody else suck me into low value. So there's high value in my time, there's low value in my time. How do I know the difference between high value and low value? This will be very critical for you as you're building this culture. This is real simple. We first start with a big goal. We call this a dominant focus. This is our big goal. I like a tangible goal. Something we can measure. Then we break that goal down to a quarter, quarterly goal, down to a monthly goal, down to a weekly goal, and then down to today. What do we have to do today to hit our weekly, to hit our monthly, hit our quarterly, hit our yearly? This determines whether there is high value activity or low value activity. So let me just give you a quick example. If I said today, what do you think the goal is going to be for this department? What do you think it's going to be? Is there a tangible outcome? Yes. What is it? What is the tangible outcome? Make sure we get the garbage in the safe for the ones that matter. Okay. All right. Can we measure it? Yes. Can we track it? Yes. Do we know if we're winning or losing? Yes. All right. So this is like winning a championship. Let's say we got one year, we got twelve months to hit that goal. Now, let's go back to these two things. What sucks energy out of your battery is low-value activity. Give me some examples of low-value activity. You already gave it to me today. What is it? Whining, complaining, pouting, arguing. Does that help us toward our goal, yes or no? no. High-value activity is specific activity that I take to hit my goal today. So a goal today is we got to get X number of deals done. Today, if we got five days in a week, seven days in a week, whatever the case may be, we got to hit our weekly goal, we got to hit our monthly, and the way we do that is we eliminate low value activity and focus on high value activity. Okay? And so think about this. Do you believe how you start your day matters, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So that's why I map out my days. Because I believe today is a very important day. And I could kind of freak my team out one time as I, they come into my office one day and I said this. And I put three numbers up there. I think it was 18.5. No, excuse me. It was 21.5. I think it's 19.5 and 18.5. Something like that. Something like this. And my team walked in one day and I said, you know what those numbers represent? And I was like, is there sales numbers? No. 
If I live to be 70, that's how many days I got left on planet Earth. If I live to be 80, that's how many days I got. If I live to be 90, that's how many days I got. That don't seem like a lot of days to me. So I said, if you feel a sense of urgency for me, it's because I got a lot of things I want to do while I'm here. And I got a little time to do it. You with me? So I do not have time for a low value activity. Whining, complaining, bitching, moaning, pointing fingers, making excuses, because I ain't got time, because I got big things I'm supposed to do. You with me? And I got a compressed time period to do it. So now, does this put things in perspective from low value versus high value, yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> okay? So for you, you gotta start saying, every day matters. The way I attack a day matters. The energy I bring matters. Because what we've done is we've got into the routine. Well, we just go through the motions. We get up, we get dressed, put our yellow outfits on, we go out there and we do our thing, and we go home. And it don't matter. Right? What I'm saying this is, hey, this ain't no practice life. You better get up and get it, because you got something to do. It's something big, okay? So I show people how I play offense versus defense, and the way I play offense, I showed you my planners. I actually created these planners. We sell these planners because so many people said, how do you attack a day? Because it looks like you always get a lot done. And I said, man, I've mapped my days out. I don't ever come into the day without a plan. I'm mapping my day out. I'm attacking the day. I am, not, I, I am in an offensive mobility. See, here's the beauty of this. I learned this about prayer, is that, is that in the old days, when we were in war, we could only advance so far toward the enemy, and we would stop and sit in a bunker and hope they didn't attack us. But the enemy could only go so far before they had to sit and stop. So we would advance and sit. Advance and sit. That's defense. And then, and then we invented something. And when we invented this, all offense. What did we invent? Armor tank. And we invented that armor tank. There ain't no stop and go. It's just like it's right here. <laughs> right or wrong? <laughs> So I had a rule when I was a basketball coach that I wanted to have the ball to the midline in less than 2.3 seconds. That means we practiced when they scored how fast we took it out, at what angle we pivoted, at what angle the point guard caught it, how we pitched ahead, because I wanted just to attack you for 32 straight minutes where you was like, stop, I can't take it. We were just relentless. And we would literally just run people in the ground. And here's how I knew, that we, here's how I knew when the game was over, they would do this. And I would teach my players that when they put their hands on their knees, it's over. Right? First one to get their hands on their knees wins. And so we would condition our players so tough, so aggressive, that we just attacked. Nolan Richardson used to call it 40 minutes of hell. <laughs> He's just going to press you for 40 minutes. You see what I'm saying? Just where you're like, please quit. Relentless, man. Well, I started coaching people in the business world, and I'm like, we got a bunch of poodles around here, not pit bulls. Nobody's attacking anything. They're just going through the motions. They're just picking up a paycheck. They, got, they need to learn how to attack a day, man. It ain't my time, it's yours. So we started playing offense versus defense. So the question is, could I actually conserve my energy? And so I call it pulsing. Pulsing means I peek up and then I rest. Like on the break, I went outside, walked around. What I'm doing is resting. And then I come back in and I peek up and then I rest. See what I'm saying? Because you ain't the only thing I got on my schedule today. I got four or five more other things I got to do. So I rest and I, and I, and I kind of decompress and then I jump back up. What if I just played up here all day? Remember, I'm trying to conserve some energy when I get home from my little girl. I'm crash and burn. That's right. It's only, you, know, you start drinking five-hour energy drinks. They don't last five hours. They last about 30 minutes, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, I'd put 30 minute energy drink. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't sell. Over the long haul, you'll end up doing more than, you can do more in three days if you go all out. But That's right. It just doesn't do That's exactly right. So Parkinson's law says work, work expands to fit the number of hours you allot to it. So you can find things to do. You could work 18 hours today if you wanted to. You could work all 24 hours if you wanted to. Because work will expand to fit that. Now, when you're thinking about this, let me show you a rhythm that I use. So when I say a time system, here's a problem. The way we see time is a problem. 
So here's my time system. I have three types of days. Okay, so I see time as this. I've been given 365 days of which I get to choose how I use them. I've been given 168 hours a week or 24 hours in a day. It's up to me how I use it. So I have three types of days. Or three types of activities. I have focus, time. This is on specific activity that's creating our dominant focus. I just call it money time. This is when I'm spending time generating something, working on something. This will be you guys out there in the field doing your thing. Then I have what's called buffer time, which is backstage. So on stage, backstage. So preparing. Like today, this is buffer time for you. Then I have off days where my mind and body can completely rest. I do believe in taking one day off a week. Some people want more than one day off a week. If God only took one day of rest, he created a whole lot in the first seven days before he took a break. Some people don't create anything and want two or three days off. Here's what I say. I want one day off a week, and for me that's Saturday. Saturday is my day off from my business. On Sunday, I plan. I spend three or four hours working on Sunday to get ready for the week. So the minute I start working on the week, then it is not an off day for me. It is a work day for me. Everybody with me? Saturday, I just take completely off from the business. Spend with my daughter, my family. It's just Sunday, we go to church. And then I come home. My daughter typically takes a nap in the afternoon. And then I work for a couple hours to get ready. So that's actually what type of day? Sunday? What if I had seven of these days? So my typical week is Sunday, and sometimes if I can get by with it, Monday. I try not to take any clients on Monday so I can meet with my team, prepare.
and what I love doing and what I was put on planet Earth to do, guess what's happened to my battery? It's charging. It's like I got it. Just like I got. It's like I got a little mophie on me. When I'm doing something I hate doing that I'm not good at, and it's pulled me out of that, it's sucking my battery out. See what you understand what I'm saying here? So I try to play in my strength zone at least 80% of the time. I'm trying to stay in my strength zone of what I'm supposed to be doing 80% of the time because my battery's being jacked up. When you get and say, hey, coach, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and I'm like, I can do it, but it ain't what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay? So when we talk about this, I take what's called many retirements. Number, number, the big lesson here, I don't obligate myself to things I'm not passionate about, number one. People ask me to do things all the time, and I say I'd love to do it, but I can't do it. I'd love to help you right here on this, but I can't help you on this. I try not to obligate myself to things. If I can't commit to it, I'm not going to get involved in it. If I commit to it, I'm all in, baby. But, but I'm not going to obligate myself to things I'm not supposed to be doing. I don't need to be doing, okay? Somebody wanted me to come to the thing the other night, and I said, look, I hadn't seen my daughter in three or four days. Man, I can't justify. How do you want me to justify not seeing my daughter to come to your thing? I'd love to come to it, but i got to see my kid. That's the first thing. That's the most important thing to me right now. So, so I also take many retirements. Many retirements is where I get out of my normal area and I, and I just need a day sometimes. So sometimes I'll leave Murfreesboro and go to Gatlinburg. We got a cabin in the mountains. We do rent that, by the way, if you ever want a good cabin. <laughs> I got a cabin in the mountains and I'll go up there. We'll go up there on Saturday and Sunday and I'll come home like a new man. I get out of my normal environment and I get away and I come back. Okay? So I take little mini retirements. And so we talked about rest and practice and playing, okay? So when you think about it, here's kind of how I map out an attack a day so I don't give crumbs. I have affirmations I use for myself. I am a person of interest. People are counting on me to show up and deliver the goods. Here's one I use a lot. Uh, my positive energy is going to be greater than any negative energy I face today. Hmm. What about this one? Never wrestle with a pig. You both get muddy and the pig loves it. <laughs> like it. That's one of mine. So what I do is, is, number one, I make up my mind, what are my, what's the highest value of my time today? How do I know high value versus low value? Pop quiz. How do I know high value versus low value? Value. Does it help me to, to my goal or not? Yeah. Low value is anything that does not move me closer to my goals. Mm -hmm. High value is you've given me a goal. I am working diligently and intentionally toward that goal. And all this other stuff, I ain't got time for. This is all low value activity. I ain't doing it. Okay? So I, a time block, I have my key hit list, my daily goals, my key activities. And then what, what happens when things come up? Like I teach a course on adversity, bounce back. That's what I'm teaching this month to my, my coaching people. Adversity is just a departure away from the ideal scene. You had an ideal scene when you came into the day, and it didn't work like that. So when you depart from the ideal scene, what's your pattern? Some people whine, lay down, quit. When you depart from the ideal scene, how do you bounce back from it? Do you bounce back quick? Do you bounce back slow? Do you blame? Do you point fingers? Does your pride get in the way? What happens? So, so when I have, what I'm saying here is I triage. And triage means as things come in, I'm triaging it. No, not important. Yes, important, right? Mm -hmm. Things don't work out perfectly like I drew up here. But at least I had a plan coming into the day. So I'm attacking that day versus attacking this, okay? All right, let's close, close with this. Okay? Here's one thing I want to challenge you to. Don't get lazy on me. Lazy means without activity or energy. It's easy to get lazy today, isn't it? Lazy toward our dreams, lazy toward our goals, lazy in our bodies, lazy in our preparation, lazy in our actions. It's easy to get lazy as we get older and we get complacent. We start getting complacent toward our dreams, toward our hopes, toward our goals. Okay? I'm a firm believer, and I'll end on this one, that you will not push yourself like somebody else will push you. Left to our own devices, 
we will all, including me, contract and retreat. See, this morning, it was easier for me to lay in bed and sleep versus go to the gym. But I can't get lazy on myself. To be, able to good, for, to be good for you, I got to have energy. And to have energy, I got to take care of my body. Everybody with me? So I pay a person to push me, challenge me. This morning, we're boxing. We're boxing. So he's got his gloves up there, and I'm boxing. He's, he's like, man, you got a lot of aggression this morning, coach. I'm like, that plane ride last night. Got a lot of aggression. I got to get out of my system this morning. But when I left there this morning at 6 o'clock, and I've done 30 or 40 minutes with him, you know what I feel like? I can handle anything. Anything you throw at me, I can handle it today. Because I already got my first big win. I already did something I didn't want to do today. Right? That built my confidence. So for you, crumbs, you may be giving crumbs to your dreams. You may be giving crumbs to your family, crumbs to your kids, crumbs to your coworkers, And it all starts with you taking some personal responsibility to say, look, I need to be pushed and challenged. All the big players want to be pushed. Why, why did Jordan go to Tim Grover? Why did Kobe Bryant have a personal coach outside of Phil Jackson? Because you know what they know? Left to their own devices, they all contract. We are creatures of habit. We will always go to the path of least resistance until somebody walks in and goes, uh-uh, Jack, push. Okay? Guys, has this been valuable for you today? Okay? Here's, hopefully, I th I f here's a sense I felt like. What I really provided for you today is a thunderbolt. There's a lot of things you got to go do to get this department where it needs to be. Here's what I would tell you. The past is finite. Never let the past hold your future hostage. You can't go back and change anything that's happened in the past. You can't change any of the leadership. You can't change any of the deals. It's over. Every second you live there, in my opinion, is, is eating away. You can't have two thoughts simultaneous at the same time. You can't talk about the past and live in the future. You understand what I'm saying here? So now it's time for a new day to start. And a new day is not going to start with the workers. It's going to start with the leaders. And the leaders being dynamic, not static, and not entropic, okay? And it should be fun for you. It should be fun for you, okay? Does anybody have any questions for me? We have cards. We do, yep. We've got cards, we've got books. Got a bus I'll say you out there. I mean, I got all kinds of stuff to say. <laughs> it's all on the market for something, right? It all will go. Do you okay? government discount on some of your books? Absolutely. We do give government. We do a lot of government work. Okay? All right, guys. Hey, thank you for having me today. God bless you. This is a beautiful place, okay? Have a great day.